I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Sound good? It's my pleasure to be here yeah. with you. This is great. Thanks. Hey, did I make that stuff up about you being in, interested in Huck Finn, too? Did we, or was that, was that true? That's absolutely true. That was the first book. My, my dad read it to me out loud, the whole thing, all the way through the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Yeah. yeah. Mysterious, scary, inviting. Yeah, and we grew up right, right across from the Red River in Manitoba, not the one in Texas, but yeah. same kind of deal as Mississippi. Muddy, long, strange, a lot of weird creatures living under there, bodies, you know, <laughs> the whole deal. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine that life that you grew up in. So, so really, what was the landscape when you looked out around outside, around your house or at your? So, you know? yeah, where I grew up, um, just south of Winnipeg, um, the city where Neil Young is from. We like to claim him. Everybody seems to, but but I think he's ours. And uh, um, basically, on on the doorstep of of wheat fields, which are now, you know, growing soybeans. But the, but back then they were all wheat. And uh, it was pretty much the only crop we had that considered us the breadbasket of the world. That was the propaganda we got in school. And, yeah. and uh, so every job I had uh, from early ages working on grain farms and, and uh, all sorts of agricultural jobs, everything from picking eggs to, uh, as you can tell, I'm really long and narrow, <laughs> so I made a, made a heck of an egg picker, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, most of, most of my, my uh, childhood was working on, on grain farms for yeah. family, family friends. And were your, uh, were your folks into music? Did you have a lot of music in your house? Yeah, my parents have this amazing record collection of, of very rare, mostly strange Texas songwriters and, and you know, things like, uh, like every Hoyt Axton record ever made oh, well. and stuff like that. So, uh, so I grew up with a pretty cool collection, which I've yeah. now completely abducted. Yeah. And because I, I scolded them for not taking care of them properly, but it's just a wonderful excuse. A ruse. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Now they're yours. Yeah. And, um, and they were, uh, it wasn't a particularly religious household, right, the one you grew up in? Absolutely not. It was <laughs> the opposite of that. Um, but there's a thing where parents and, and kids, you know, you kind of, kids grow up and you want to do what your parents didn't do. That's right. I mean, and that song, Big Smoke, uh, that I wrote is, is, you know, I remember the, the closest thing I came to church was having like a major crush on a very devout Christian girl at 16. <laughs> and, and she used to keep that good book in between us, literally, you know, and it was, and man, she had a lot of copies of it too, you know. So it was, it was, it was just when you're making progress, out comes yeah, the book. Yeah. <laughs> but so I remember on, on a hockey trip in War Road, Minnesota, I stole a copy of the Good News Bible placed by the Gideons at the hotel, and I, and I started mining the pages of the New Testament for pickup lines, you know? And, and, wow. And that, be, that began my sort of uh, revolution in terms of considering some sort of spiritual walk. Yeah. That was the first kind of moment where I thought, maybe there's something to this, you know? Well, you, uh, and you went, next thing you know, you're in a Bible college. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've spent a year in Bible school and still trying to remember how they, they got me to go, and, and now I didn't get kicked out and all that stuff. Right. But, but I really enjoyed that year. It was basically like living in community with a bunch of really strange people of different minds. And, yeah. and uh, I remember just being thoroughly confused the whole time, but, but uh, I, I definitely uh, look fondly upon that. You know? And you studied uh, philosophy at a Mennonite school also? Yeah, and I was in school in Chicago as well. I was just yeah. basically spending as much of the government's money as I could on education. That <laughs> That, that wouldn't help me. Oh, in right, the end. it's Canada. Yeah, <laughs> Canada, man. I have to tell you, they're, they're, Canada's pretty pretty good to musicians too. And being from Manitoba, as I understand it, there's sort of a allocation of arts funding that goes to every every province. So if yeah. you live in a less populated province, that means more for you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, it's a strange thing because our Manitoba Music Association has actually been able to measure the economic the economic impact that music brings back to Manitoba, and they've actually been able to prove that, that the numbers are, you know, so many percentage more than right. what they give out. And so we're actually going up against all companies and as a valuable economic export, That's not just as something. And then the government gets to look, you know, very nice and kind when they say we support the arts, but the only reason we're really getting the money is because we've taken the time to prove what it does wow. to the local community and what it brings back and how many dollars, actual figures, hard numbers. We'd like to see those studies. And artists don't need to be afraid of that. You no, know? I mean, I, we're, we're in that same conversation here and I think it's, it's something that is being proved all over the place, mm. that if you want a vibrant economy in a vibrant community, you need arts and culture and that includes music. And they go hand in hand. Yeah. 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 Um, and what's the music community like in Winnipeg, the, the big city near you? I mean, I live about four hours from, that, from there now on, oh, okay. on this little 
I guess you can call it a ranch. It's kind of an intimate ranch, maybe. Uh, but but uh, but so I, I pine for those all my musical friends, and and uh, we have a great community of players, and and uh, so many of them end up just working for all these fancy bands across the country because it's right in the middle of the country, and so it's a really good spot to live, and it's cheap to live. It's one of those cities that. You, like all the musicians I know own houses. Like it's a kind of a miracle of a place, you know? Yeah. Well, it is Canada after all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, one of those musicians or one of the musicians that you've been working with is a guy who's uh, uh, not only a pedal steel player, but also very aptly named Bill Western. He's the best pedal steel player name that ever was. He's actually yeah. Bill Western the third. Bill Western so the third. It's even better. Oh, that's why. Yeah. Um, but you guys made your latest record together. Yeah. And speaking of trying to capture the sound of the landscape of these wide open spaces, as I understand it, you even made a reverb tank that's straight out of the Manitoba plain. Well, that's the thing. It's like you see, you grew up with all this infrastructure that was used and, and then gets kind of abandoned because farming changes its scope. And I have a whole bunch of songs that I'm writing, you know, before this album that are that are basically trying to link the urban and the rural and trying to, you know, separate that tension as much as possible. And and so how better to do that than actually put real infrastructure, the sounds I grew up around? Why not Why not try to make that and put that into the actual sonic fabric of fa fabric of an album? So that was yeah. the whole point. So we, you know, got rid of all the pigeons in, in this 150 foot concrete grain silo and and then uh, I won't explain how we got rid of them or anything but um, <laughs> and, and and then started hanging mics and experimenting and it was also one of those things where you start feeling hanging like a kid. mics yeah, hanging yeah microphones I, I thought you said mice but it was mics oh uh, yeah you got to scare the pigeons away with yeah. mice <laughs> you know it's an old just, prairie trick. It's radio. I just want to make sure everybody <laughs> yeah. knows. Yeah. yeah. So we hang microphones at various levels and, and then replay whatever track you want to get this reverb. You excite this room and then you capture that excitement and then you can adjust how much of that effect you want on that yeah. particular track, right? And, you know, people hear stories about making, I mean, maybe some of you do, heard stories about making records in the 50s where they would, you know, you put reverb uh, from a stairwell or something, put a microphone at the bottom, or they would record a Simon and Garfunkel snare drum at the bottom of an elevator shaft. It's the mm -hmm. same kind of idea where you've created your, your prairie reverb tank. Well, in all the great studios you guys were talking about earlier have these, you know, real reverb uh, chambers in the basements, and then you can fill them up with water and adjust how long the tails are on these things. And I didn't... You know, on a record that's that's about my home and so close to me, I thought, why can't we have a real reverb sound? Why do we have to just lean on the computer? And, and you know, on another note, it, it's a record, and so it's something that you can't just easily reproduce again and, and yeah. copy, and that was sort of another exciting point of it. And it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> you and your crazy friends go and, you know, put some speakers and microphones in a giant abandoned silo. That's just it's a good story. Well, the studio is, is it could be pretty tiring and, and lame after a while. It feels like a laboratory, and, and especially, you know, guys who are used to working outside and, and manual labor, getting us to do something else is really important, and, and it, it got people, you know, in a better mood, I think, in general. Yeah. I feel like we're actually doing something important, and it, it doesn't feel like we're just sitting around, you know, eating chips or whatever. Right. <laughs> whatever it takes. I mean, you know, you're basically making a... <laughs> I mean, literally making a record is mostly about capturing moments, and you hope that you get some good moments. You hope that the circumstances don't get in the way, and that uh, you hope you have good chemistry with the people you're working with. But that you know, whatever it takes, it's it's absolutely in the summertime when the weather. Is high. That's a good record, for example. Better ringtone. That's a though. horrible use for a really good record. Um, let me just uh, wrap up by saying a couple things. One is that the first guy that I was exposed to or, or knew of who captured the sort of look and feel of the Canadian Prairie was Ian Tyson, singer-songwriter that was a big part of my, my youth. Is he somebody that you were influenced by or aiming at? Yeah, I mean, he has a famous record, at least in Canada, it's famous, called Cowboyography. And, and uh, it's a record that distincts, distinctly links ge geography and, and, and songs. And you can't separate person from place. That's what we've been talking about all night. And, and uh, I wanted to do the same thing with the Manitoba Prairie or, the, or even the Midwestern kind of states and, and that aesthetic. Yeah. And so that's sort of why my record is called Prairieography. You know, it's named after that. And, and Ian Tyson's been this absolutely giant influence in my life since, yeah. since I started trying to write songs, you know. Well, these Canadians are onto something, folks. I just want to let you know. And uh, they have their own awards, 
the, the equivalent of the Grammy, the Canadian Juno Awards. I don't know if you could call it equivalent, but... <laughs> Corollary, it's, a, it's a, 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 a pale imitation or something. Well, you know what? I actually, I disagree. I actually think it's um, it's a it's a more it's a more honest representation of the Canadian music scene than the Grammys, which are all about who's famous and who's glitzy. That's, that's true. So I think I, I wouldn't sell yourselves short yet. We complain about the same thing though, on, but nobody really listens to yeah. it. So, <laughs> well, there's only there's only so many of that's you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> It's Canada. <laughs> anyway, but you've been nominated for a couple of Juno Awards. Yeah. And, um, and so you're making progress. You've now got True North Records, which I know uh, was, was Bruce Coburn's uh, uh, label, mm -hmm. and, and the legendary Bernie Finkelstein That's is right. involved in your world, Canadian music uh, biz legend. Yeah. Did he sort of, is he involved in your career at all? No, I'm thoroughly scared of the guy. Yeah. You know? Uh, <laughs> Fear, fear is the governing factor in my life. I enjoy it. I mean, you know, I... Use it to your advantage. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, but I, I've had, like, very brief kind of conversations with, with these big suit-wearing guys. He doesn't wear a suit, but I feel like he should. And, uh, <laughs> and I, it's, in, it's really intimidating for me. I, I feel much more comfortable on stage and, and not trying to hobnob. Most artists do, and, and yeah. I'm learning to be good at that part of the yeah. job, because it's, it's important. Yeah. But. Well, you're doing a good job right now. Hobnobbing. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting to get to, get to know you a little bit. Um, it, it does sort of put a picture in my mind of, of where you come from and, and where these songs come from. And, uh, and I call that you know, that's, that's successful storytelling. Thanks. Yeah. Congratulations. We're going to get back to music. Welcome back, Del Barber. Right on. <laughs> 